Good evening. I'm Brittany Hobson. Leaders from the nation where the remains of 215 children were found at the former residential school in Kamloops held a virtual press conference today. But Chief Roseanne Kashmir did agree to meet exclusively with APTN's Tina House about the discovery and what happens next. They join us now. Thank you. I'm standing here outside of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School with Cookby Casimir. Cookby Casimir, can you tell us exactly what's going to happen now traditionally with protocol moving forward? So right now, traditionally with protocol moving forward, we're still in the initial steps moving forward and that plan is going to be rolled out. I know that our cultural and language revitalization department has been working with our elders and having some of those um, discussions, so it's still early. Obviously, there's many questions still yet to be answered. Uh, many nations from across Canada also have had residential schools, obviously, that they've dealt with. Many other family members from other nations are wondering where are our children, what's happened to them. What would you like to say to those other nations that are wondering what's next now? Because it seems like you guys here are the leader in dealing with this, this type of crisis. Yes, I definitely agree. You know, we as First Nations right across Canada are feeling the same impacts, the same traumas, the same hurts. All those wounds have reopened. And, you know, for us, you know, we are leading the way, but we also want to be able to be support as well. And definitely we need to be supported and working with our Cookbees and our Chiefs of the Shwetmuk Nation and BC. And um, nationally, we'll also be sharing what we're doing here to support them as well. Because right across Canada with those who have attended residential school, they're going through those same questions and unanswered questions that we are. Obviously, you have reached, uh, so many people want to reach out and, and offer their support, their condolences, and whatever they can do to try to understand the magnitude of this this uh, horrible act that's happened here. I know that uh, you mentioned in about two weeks we'll hear more from the uh, final report, I guess, of what the findings are. Um, I know that on Saturday there's going to be truckers that are going to be lit up in orange. I've also heard uh, people on motorcycles coming from Surrey, from the Sikh community, are also going to be, you know, sharing their support. Um, what do you need from the public right now and, and is all this support a bit too much at this time or are you still open to all of these initiatives happening? Well what I would like to say is we are truly overwhelmed with all the support and at the same token we are extremely appreciative. Um, you know it's about everyone learning our truths and the truths that we as First Nations have been endured with and with the outpour like with the um, events that are being planned um, we've seen those on Facebook and through um, various sources so right now we are working with the local First Nations Health to also make sure that we have the resources available here to ensure that everyone maintains some social distancing and you know if there's some parameters in place to you know at least help and assist us you know during that time and for us it is truly an honor to you know have that support and we are so appreciative and um, you know, I just wanted to just remind everyone just to remember that we haven't had our second vaccination yet. That is still, you know, appointments are just being sent right now. And um, at the same token, we're going to be following all those parameters in place to ensure that everyone's safety is, is being mindful. And um, truly, you know, I just want to acknowledge those rallies that are coming through here. And, you know, we hold our hands up to them for, you know, giving us that support because it means a lot. I always say that it's it's those positive, heartfelt sentiments that take us that long distance and gives us that inner strength that we need to keep doing what we do do. Cookby Casimir, we wish you continued success and strength as you carry us through this horrible tragedy that's taken place here on your lands. Back to you in studio. Thanks for that, Tina. Yesterday was the long-awaited official release of the National Action Plan, as requested in the final report of the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Today, the federal government revealed their part of the plan. However, during the press conference, Justin Trudeau was asked why should Indigenous people trust the government to fulfill their commitments. The Prime Minister acknowledged that historically the federal government has repeatedly let down Indigenous people and that it will take more than words to achieve reconciliation. That's why there's nothing I can say that's suddenly going to make everything all right. That's why the work of reconciliation is hard and it involves more than just a government. 
It involves Canadians. It involves organizations and uh, orders of government. It involves individual choices and collective choices. And most of all, it involves action. Now to Iqaluit, where residents gathered for a vigil for the 250 children discovered buried at the Kamloops Residential School. Residents gathered at Iqaluit Square, right outside the elders' home, for a socially distanced gathering. The vigil ran throughout the afternoon for 215 minutes, and people rotated through to avoid too large a crowd at once due to Iqaluit's COVID-19 restrictions. These children are sadly only a fraction of thousands of children that were never returned home. We are here to support them as well as one another in our journey towards peace. People in the Yukon are sharing in the grief and doing their part to give support for the 215 children's remains found at the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. Here's Sarah Connors with that story. Over 400 children's shoes were placed around these steps at the Sacred Heart Cathedral in Whitehorse, guarded by this woman who stood watch over them. Later that day, drummers led an otherwise silent march through downtown, escorting the shoes to the Kwanlin Don Cultural Center, where a sacred fire will burn for four days. Chief Linda Dixon of Car Cross Tagish First Nation says her community is reeling from the discovery. The incident that happened in Kamloops is uh, devastating. It's devastating to all First Nations people across Canada, um, devastating to the people of Car Cross and the Yukon. She says it hits close to home. These ruins in Car Cross were once home to a residential school. It's opened up a lot of uh, wounds for the Car Cross Tagish First Nation citizens and um, people of the Yukon. That's why her First Nation has joined many others calling for in a full investigation into other residential school sites. They're children and they need to be recognized for who they are as First Nations children. So they're um, about three inches high and two inches wide. Velma Olson is a Nachanayaktan First Nation beater in Mayo. She started a Facebook group asking people to send her moccasin tops, which she plans to create a display with in memory of the children. You know, just to have a more permanent memorial and for a place where people can, you know, feel like they're, they're doing something or doing something for, for this. She says in just three days, 1,500 people have committed to making the tops, some from as far away as the United States. It made me feel very um, humble to... Um, have so many people reach out and want to take part in this. An act of light in the darkness. It's very humbling to know that there's so many people out there that that need an outlet for this, for for grieving and for to show how much they, they miss and how much they're hurting. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse and Car Cross. It's been a week since the news out of Kamloops. Amid the grief and outrage, there are still questions to be answered. Some of them are legal. Brad Regeer is the grandson of a residential school survivor and the Canadian Bar Association's first Indigenous president. Thanks for joining us today. So I'm just going to start here. Um, who must accept responsibility for the deaths of these and thousands of other residential school students now that many of those responsible are no longer around? Well, in my view, the federal government needs to accept responsibility. And I have said repeatedly that the churches need to step up and take responsibility as well. Uh, the fact that the Roman Catholic Church has not issued an apology is, is uh, very problematic, but um, they need to step up with the federal government to address this issue. Uh, Kamloops will not be the only uh, place where these discoveries are made, and, and there's been there's was testimony through the TRC uh, about other sites, and it was ignored um, by the government. Uh, they said it was too expensive. To, to do the investigations and to do the re reclamation. Uh, well, this is staring Canada in the face. 
and, uh, and, and those entities and the government need to take responsibility. Looking, I guess, at the, the larger picture, um, how does the law need to address this issue or, or can it address this issue? Well, that's a very interesting question because I think if we, you know, if we started initiating court actions and seeking orders and all that kind of stuff, I, my, my concern was is that we would get bogged down in process and arguing who is responsible and how much and all that kind of stuff. For me, what needs to happen here is that the federal government and the churches need to take the responsibility. Don't fight Indigenous people and Indigenous communities on this issue. Uh, be proactive and get this done. Uh, I, 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 I can't think of something that would be more insulting to the memory of those who didn't come home to survivors than to have this get dragged out in court for years and years. Um, so, as we mentioned, you're the first Indigenous president of the Canadian Bar Association. And there are a number of calls to action in the TRC's final report that pertain to the justice system. How are you hoping to address those as head of the Bar Association? Well, the Canadian Bar Association uh, committed itself to the calls to action in the TRC report, uh, all uh, to the 94 of them, and particularly those that impacted the justice system. The Canadian Bar Association developed its own TRC work plan uh, over two years ago. Uh, we have developed uh, continuing professional development training for our members and for, for lawyers at large, uh, including trauma-informed uh, uh, podcast series with Marina McCallum. Uh, we have we spoke out in support of the TRC and establishing it all those many years ago. Uh, and certainly, I, as president, have done uh, every what I can. Uh, in my position and to, to commit the CBA to um, seeing those fulfilled. I mean, the, what we have is we've got a report now that is going to be hitting six years old. Uh, the report on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is two years old. Uh, we have lots of calls to action, lots of calls to justice. Uh, I would like to see these implemented. Uh, you, you know, we, yesterday we had the government's response the missing and murdered Indigenous women. So that's a that's a first step. But the problem we have with so many issues with, with Indigenous legal matters is that there's a lot of first steps that are taken. And those second and third and fourth steps either take a really long time or they don't happen at all. Uh, so I want to see these calls to action. I want to see greater implementation of them. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on today and uh, taking the time to chat with us. Uh, thanks again. Thank you. The National Indian Residential School Crisis Line is available for survivors and others who might need support. That number is 1-866-925-4419. Time now for a quick break. Coming up, nationwide reaction to the release of the MMIWG National Action Plan. Welcome back. The federal government says they've earmarked $2.2 billion to implement the national MMIWG action plan announced yesterday. The Crown Indigenous Relations Minister says she is proud of the action plan despite the mixed reviews. Meanwhile, the Minister of Women and Gender Equality added that nothing is going to bring back the nation's stolen sisters, but that the federal action plan is one of a kind in the world. This is a live document too. It won't just sit on a shelf. It will just get stronger and stronger as Canadians resolve to end this national tragedy get stronger and stronger. And our, our government will be there to close those cell gaps, to address the highways of tears and to do right by those whose stories ended too soon. In Manitoba, Tina Fontaine was under provincial care when her body was pulled from the Red River in 2014. Her murder helped establish the national MMIWG inquiry. Some Winnipeg advocacy groups have said the inquiry is flawed and they called for the commissioners to resign. The same groups are now saying the new federal action plan is vague, but a step in the right direction. I wish it was a reflection of everything that I see going on in those circles with the women and 
you know, um, the working groups that are out there, the coalition members, the non you know, the Indigenous led organizations. I wish um, the report was similar to all of that, you know, that work that we're advocating for and working hard towards and hopefully one day it will be. I don't know that it fully addresses the whole, all the 231 calls for justice in a way that is needed, in a way that is meaningful, and in a way that creates space for everybody at that grassroots level. So it, I think it's, it's a good start. It's those first steps. In Saskatchewan, local advocate Darlene Okimesum Sakote says the MMIWG action plan has good points and some bad. Ogi Mason Sakote co chairs the Saskatoon group Walk, Women Walking Together. She says more work needs to be done, but the plan's focus is encouraging. Just taking a glance of um, the document, that I'm really happy with the four areas that they're focusing on justice, um, wellness, um, human security, you know, all those other, other goodies. I'm really, really liking that they're wanting to do an oversight body as well. Swinging over to Quebec now, where Indigenous-specific government announcements have been piling up all week. Lindsay Richardson joins us now to break it down. From the end of the Echequan Commission in Trois-Rivières to the multi-million dollar funding announcement to fight domestic violence in Nunavik to the National Assembly's commemoration of the Kamloops 215, this week's Quebec news cycle has been non-stop. And just when we thought the government couldn't pack in any more news, they slipped by two press releases Thursday night, each addressing a different long-running issue for First Nations. After two years of back and forth and on the ground demonstrations, Quebec and the Algonquin Nation have reportedly reached an agreement regarding sport hunting of moose in the Lavarandre Wildlife Reserve. C'est une entente sur quatre ans qui avait été acceptée par l'ensemble des communautés algonquines qui vient d'être entérinée par le Conseil des ministres. Ça nous assure à tous et toutes d'une paix sociale pour les quatre prochaines années. According to the ministry press release, to preserve the herd, the random draw for moose hunting packages has been temporarily suspended for 2021 and 2022. This will enable the parties to jointly conduct studies in the field. The goal is to bring up population numbers while also looking at how industry impacts their habitat. The recent discovery of children's remains in Kamloops is also prompting important conversations at the provincial level about missing and murdered Indigenous children and the need to provide closure to their families. De voir une preuve tangible de cette horreur, ça nous rappelle le lourd passé, le lourd passé du Canada, mais aussi du Québec dans nos relations avec les nations autochtones. The National Assembly held a moment of silence this week for the 215 children recovered in Kamloops, B.C. And shortly afterwards, they passed Bill 79, known as the Baby's Law, to help families obtain information from a health and social services institution, an organization, or a religious congregation if an Indigenous child disappeared there before 1992. The Innu and Atikamekw nations alone have reported dozens of these cases. So what's next? Will the Assembly finally pass Indigenous-led health plan Joyce's principle? Will Quebec start searching its own residential school sites? All we know right now is that we'll keep bringing you the news as it happens. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. We've got a new episode of APTN Investigates coming your way. More on that after the break. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. St. John's, 27 in Halifax. 12 in rain in Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Nine above in Nain. 26 in Quebec City. 22 in Val d'Or. Sunny skies and 31 in Toronto, London and Sarnia. 27 above in Thunder Bay, 29 in Sioux Lookout with mixed sun and cloud. In northern Manitoba, 22 above in God's Lake, 25 in La Paw. It's going to be a hot one in Winnipeg and Brandon at 34 degrees. In Saskatchewan, 27 in sunny skies and swift current, 32 in Estevan. 20 in rain in Buffalo Narrows, 14 in Stony Rapids. 
picking back up in northern Alberta, 23 above in Fort McMurray, 20 degrees in Grand Prairie. 23 in Lethbridge, 26 in rain in Medicine Hat, over to the west coast, 19 degrees in Victoria, 17 in rain in Campbell River, 12 above in Smithers, 21 degrees in Fort Nelson, in the Yukon, 17 above in Dawson, 13 in Old Crow, over to the NWT, cloudy skies and rain, 20 above in Trout Lake, 20 in Fort Liard. 9 degrees in Fort McPherson, 4 in Inuvik. In Nunavut, sitting at 0 degrees in Whale Cove, 2 above in Chesterfield. 1 in Igloolik, and 2 in some sun in Arctic Bay. In the 1960s, a small group of Dene were forcibly removed from their land by the federal government. Tonight, Colin Crozier looks into their decades-long fight for redress. He joins us now from Yellowknife. Thanks for joining us, Colin. What can we expect to see in Refugees in Our Land, Part 2? Yeah, well, last week I, I kind of uh, gave a historical overview on, on this, this community, this historic community called uh, Rocha River that was essentially abandoned by the federal government in the 1960s. Uh, the people that lived there, the Tatsotene, were essentially scattered across the north and forced to join other bands and basically they forced off of their traditional homeland. So last week was kind of this historical overview. This week I kind of take the story I into modern times. We follow the descendants of Rasha River and their struggle over the years to hold on to their, their culture and their identity. And they do that through it through a number of ways. One is through uh, dog mushing and kind of keeping this um, this sense of identity um, through that. Another is through their language. Um, a few of the people that we follow ha have kept the language alive over the years as well. So I wanted to try to bring the, the that story kind of into modern modern times and show the the fight that the Tatsuotene still are are having um, to re reclaim their their culture and tradition. What has the response been like from the federal government? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the Tatsuotene have been kind of fighting for the last 60 years to, to get their band reinstated. And we reached out to the feds asking, you know, what that process was like. And basically, um, they came back with kind of the same stuff that they've been saying to the Tatsuotene for the last 60 years, which is that the Rasha River ban isn't recognized under the Indian Act. Um, even though they, they signed treaty as the Russia River Ban back in 1900, Treaty 8. Um, so, it, I, you know, it hasn't really been the response that the, the people of Russia River have been looking for, but we, we dig into that in the dock as well. We'll make sure to check that out right after the news. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Brittany. Just want to say, Chimi Gwech, this is the last time I'll be guest hosting the news as I'm moving on to a new job in the next couple of weeks, but I'll still be reporting for the Canadian press. Thank you for allowing me to share the stories of our peoples over the past five years. I'm Brittany Hobson. Have a great evening.